Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. For your listening and dancing pleasure today, a story of murder, greed, corruption, and adultery. The Broadway burlesque Chicago, now the longest running American musical in Broadway history, 25 years. A revival that razzle dazzled audiences from the moment it opened in 1996, starring B.B. Newworth and Anne Ranking. Yeah. 10,000 performances later, Chicago has been seen by 33 million people in 36 countries. The staggering success of Chicago is even more stunning considering the fact that no one wanted to touch this show. Not the Schuberts, not the Nederlanders, no one but an unknown couple from New Jersey. Their story next. I am so delighted to welcome to the program Barry Weisler. He and his wife, Fran, produced Chicago, the revival that's on Broadway now. Unfortunately, Fran can't be with us today. Hello, Barry. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me, Tony. It's a, it's a delight. I wonder, 25 years on, do you still sometimes wonder at the improbable circumstances of your success with this show? Uh, no, not not the success, Tony, because Fran and I believed in this production from the from the get go. Um, it, it, it's something else when we look back to how the journey began and where it is now. Uh, it is the magic of theater that something like this is possible. Uh, and uh, it's been proven out by Chicago's long, long life. Exactly. Uh, you guys uh, had to do a lot of wand waving to make that magic happen. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, but let's go back to maybe even further than you had in mind. Y you were you were in um, Uppsala College in East Orange and you were flunking out <laughs> and true. and you discovered theater. Let's talk about that. Uh, I remember receiving a letter from the dean saying, you, you know, the first half of your freshman year, you've received three D's and three F's. And if mm. you can't pick this up to a C average, you're gone. Uh, and Uppsala in those days was the only school one could get into without an SAT passing grade. Um, I just was not capable. I was somewhat illiterate in those days. Uh, my educational background was stunted. And here I am wandering there in a deep depression, not knowing what the next step could possibly be, wandering in the back parking lot to a little cottage that must have been, uh, you know, a handyman's uh, abode years ago. Uh, murmuring was coming from the walls and the bond doors, the sliding mm -hmm. bond doors, and uh, it just sort of drew me to, to it. I opened the doors, discovered it's the, uh, the uh, college's uh, little theater on campus, rehearsing a piece of Shakespeare, measure for measure. Didn't know what it was at the time, learned later. <laughs> uh, went in, sat down in the back, and I was home. It was comfortable, it was warm, it was embracing. And that was the beginning, I never left. What, what do you think it was about that experience, Barry, that reached you yeah. almost immediately? Who knows what spiritual moments occur to a human being, why you pick one mate over another, why you pick an occupation that you, you do. Who knows, it just felt right and it felt comfortable. And that's all she wrote. You told um, Michael Riedel uh, for his book, uh, Singular Sensation, uh, he has a quote from you in that book said, the theater saved me. Yeah. 
When I think of what I could have become without a college education, without any desire but to do things that were poetic, romantic, and magical, and what were those things? I, I tried to, I don't know if you're gonna get to it, uh, Tony, but I tried bullfighting. Uh, <laughs> I, would... I failed. <laughs> well, you, you didn't get bored, I hope. <laughs> What's that, Tony? You didn't get gored, I hope. No, no, I never got to that level, believe me. How does, how does one fail at bullfighting? And uh, where was this? Uh, you fail when you're so frightened you don't want to go into the ring. <laughs> that's, that's the number one failure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I tried being a chef. Um, I tried writing. Uh, none of those things fell into, I wanted to be an athlete, a professional athlete. None of those things occurred. Now I do it all. Yeah. I, I can create a bullfighting play. I can create a food play and be a famous chef. I can do it all. That's what theater brings you. And you, uh, I'm told you were uh, a fairly decent uh, character actor. Did you have much an ambition to, to actually be on the stage? That's all I wanted to do was be an actor. Uh, that's how I started at Uppsala College uh, as a character actor. And then I met Stella Adler and studied with her in the late 50s, early 60s with a buddy of mine, Bob De Niro. Remember Robert? I've, I've heard of him. And to him. Uh, you have Bob De Niro, uh, Alvin Ailey was there, Lee Grant was there, oh my goodness, Warren Beatty. Uh, we had quite, quite a class. Mullen Brando had left by that time. But uh, she's responsible uh, for my becoming uh, a director and then a producer. She gave me the anchors, the understanding of theater and how to break a script down and what should be put in front of the public and why. Uh, those were all the things that began with Dear Stella. I've heard, uh, by the way, that Robert De Niro has gone on to have a fair amount of success, but I uh, haven't seen him much lately. Maybe you have. I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he's, uh, he's his own person, let us say. <laughs> Yeah, I get that impression. Uh, let's jump ahead a little bit. So you so you found theater, and and you're you're deeply you're getting deeply involved, and you meet Fran. Let's talk about that. And you form something called I think it was called it is called the National Theater Company. Is that it? That is correct. And the company that I had before that was called the National Shakespeare Company. I gather hmm. all these honorifics, you know. Everything is, uh, uh, it wasn't very national. It was uh, New York City and West Orange, New Jersey. Uh, and I met Fran uh, at a small theater in West Orange uh, in a shopping plaza. Uh, we became friendly and uh, stayed friendly for, um, what is it now? We're married about 54 years and we knew each other before that. I think it's working. <laughs> It's a I good think it's work. And the idea behind those those companies, as I understand it, Barry, was you were going to do classic work, classic plays with professional actors on, on tour around, you know, New Jersey and other places. And uh, uh, and but you ran into an immediate problem in, in, in the in uh, in the in the idea, the way you guys had con you and Fran had constructed the idea that these were going to be in public schools. Uh, this is very true, Tony. Uh, we thought it would be easy to just bring a piece of Shakespeare or uh, uh, a children's piece of literature like Tom Sawyer or Swiss Family Robinson. But what we found out is you can't charge during the school day in a public school. Uh, so these two uh, newcomers uh, to the theater world, these two Jewish uh, men and women, went into the Catholic school system. Uh -huh. And lo and behold, we could charge 50 cents for the elementary schools uh, per student and a dollar for the high schools. And that was the beginning of our business. And it just grew. Yeah, it sure did. Um, I, I, was, I was drawn to a, a report of an, a couple of early productions. They were um, one-act plays by Chekhov, two of them. 
Huh. And uh, you needed a you needed a good actor, and you called an old buddy, didn't you? That's it. That was that was Bobby's first job out of acting school. Can you believe that? De Niro, the, we're talking okay, about. Robert De Niro had him on the road. Uh, he got a call in uh, at a girls' academy in Peapack Gladstone, New Jersey. Still mm -hmm. don't remember. I can't remember the name of the academy. Uh, and it was um, uh, it was uh, the gentleman who did greetings. Oh, oh. yeah, it's uh, I can't I can't pull out the name either. But uh, he was is this where he was making fifty bucks a week and you offered him sixty five? Uh, I don't remember that, Tony. If it's colorful enough, put it in the story. Oh, okay. I don't remember that. I remember that he wanted to leave uh, and start filming and. I said, we have no way to replace you. We didn't have understudies. He helped me carry the sets in and out of the schools off the top of the station wagon. I couldn't lose him. And uh, I told him he owed me. So he called the, the gentleman who uh, directed the piece, uh, whom we can't remember, and uh, did all of his shooting late afternoon into the evening. And then we play at 10 o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon. So there's plenty of time for him to get to New York and uh, do the first piece. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're, you're doing these productions on, on the road. And at, at what point did you decide, hey, we, you know, we somehow need to turn this business to getting something on Broadway? Or were you always thinking that way? Oh, no, no. We were just uh, working day to day and living hand to mouth. We weren't even thinking of Broadway. Broadway was a magical kingdom that had nothing to do with St. Aloysius Academy in New Jersey, where we were doing uh, Latin in its magic lap. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was just a world that belonged in New York City at the highest level just happened that we began to do colleges and fine arts centers with uh, Neil Simon, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, and one person shows, Julie Harris in the Bell of Amherst, Leslie Nielsen in Clarence Darrow, and James Earl Jones in Paul Robeson. And Jimmy, for political reasons and difficulties from the family, the Robeson family, uh, canceled the entire season of the production. Mm. Th this was uh, a heartbreaker to me and Fran because um, we were living hand to mouth and this was an important item, James Earl Jones. It uh, doesn't get any better than that. And uh, I said to him and he agreed that he owed me one and it was just by happenstance that I was reading the New York Times in a state of depression that Sunday and realized that Chris Plummer was up at Stratford doing Henry the Fourth, part one and two. And I, you know, I was used to doing Shakespeare by this time. And I called the Stratford Shakespeare uh, Stratford Festival, spoke to Charlie Parker, still remember. Oh and uh, told him that I have uh, James Earl Jones, which I didn't at that time. Uh, and would he ever consider canceling one of the Henry's and we would deliver James Earl Jones as Othello with Chris Plummer playing Iago. And he said, I'll call you right back. Called back in three minutes, said, you've got it. They agreed to pay for everything. I Ooh. needed only one thing. James Earl Jones, because he didn't know that I had offered him to Stratford. But he but owed God, you one. God bless him. And he liked the idea. Uh, so that was by happenstance, our first really grown up production uh, that uh, we took out on the road after Stratford uh, and did enormous grosses. And then Dear Cy Leslie from CBS Fine Art Films um, wanted to document the show. So he gave me enough money to dress it up, we rehearse and bring it to the Winter Garden in New York City. And that's all she wrote.
Uh, that was, as I understand it, that was your first Broadway production. Yep. Othello, James Earl Jones, Christopher Happen Plummer. Happenstance. Yeah. What was that, 1981 or two? Right. We toured in 81 and came in in February of 1982. And guess what? The Weislers win a Tony with their first Broadway production. Which, which award was it for revival or? Uh, the best, best uh, play revival. And we also had Medea uh, running that year, uh, Bob Whitehead's production with Zoe Caldwell. And she won for best actress in a play. So there we are with two, two Tonys in our hands, very first time out. And um, I love the moment uh, on national television when Hal Linden presents you guys with the Tony and you guys are so unknown. Nobody in Broadway knows you people. And he says, and the Tony goes to the Weaslers. <laughs> That's very true. That was yeah. true. Yeah. But it was a great moment, obviously. I mean, winning a first Tony and, and arriving, at least in that sense, Ooh, on Broadway. Very exciting. Let's jump, uh, Barry, to uh, 1996, when, when City Center is doing an encore uh, presentation of Chicago. Briefly, for the audience that may not know, what, what, what is... What are Encores pr uh, productions? Encores was uh, put together with uh, friends of mine uh, uh, to bring back those pieces that would never be seen again because they were dusty old chestnuts uh, that belonged to an ancient musical world. Uh, and they considered Chicago one of these dusty old musicals. Um, obviously, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Obviously, none of us knew what it meant until we had it on stage with that magnificent first cast. And everyone realized how smart Fred Ebb, Bob Fosse, John Kander were, uh, how, how perceptive, cynical, dark, but always entertaining. Yeah, well, sexy and, and sizzling and... Uh... So many, so many attributes to that show. Just to tie the bow on the on the on the uh, encores concept, what it what it is is they they perform these revivals just four times over a weekend. Right. Um, there's an orchestra on stage, but there's you know the actors are in not in costume, and sometimes they're even carrying the script, and they're just doing four productions on a Friday, two on Saturday, one on Sunday. Right. And you guys um, already knew had relation uh, had a relationship with with Kander and have John Kander the uh, the composer and Fred Ebb the lyricist and decide to go see the Saturday matinee of Chicago uh, and tell tell us that story. First of all, we just felt an obligation to see everything Encores does. So it was sort of fulfilling an obligation. We had no idea what we were going to experience. Uh, the first act opened up with this wonderful, perfect cast, and it was heaven. It was, uh, it, it was just the most magical, marvelous, entertaining, funny piece of theater we had seen in years. And at the end of the first act, a gentleman, I believe he had a heart attack, uh, and the intermission came, he was uh, uh, at his seat, uh, everyone was a bit hysterical. I assumed at this point, the evening, the afternoon is over. You, you don't survive an audience member having a heart attack. Marsha Lewis, our Mama Morton, who was a registered nurse, comes running out of the side door to administer to him. The ambulance pulls up and uh, we know the the day is dead. There is no way you're going to survive this, taking that poor gentleman out. Uh, 45 minutes later, the second act opened and the show overcame death. Yeah, <laughs> it did on the spirit of that amazing cast you're talking about, B.B. Newworth, uh, Anne Reinking, um, James Norton, James Joe Norton. Gray. 
Joel Gray. I mean, when the, it, for people who don't know where the way the second act of Chicago starts, Bibi Newworth in that case is up on a ladder on the side of the proscenium arch and swings around and says, "What is she? What's the line? Hello, suckers! Hello, suckers! Welcome back!" <laughs> And I mean, whatever the, the horrible thing that happened with that person who, who had the heart attack, I mean, it's is gone. It's forgotten. Again, citing Michael's book, Michael Riedel's book, um, Candor and Ed were there, as you would expect. Uh, and he quotes uh, John Candor as saying, why can't this last forever? Do you, do you recall him saying that? Or? I don't, but I would expect him to say that. Yeah, it's his show after all. Yeah. Okay. And it is lasting forever. Um, yeah. and, and they were just stunned uh, because they felt every number stopped the show. One after another, after another, after another, stopping this show. Exactly. And your reaction, you and Fran was... To, to what you were seeing was what? Well, we just wanted uh, this to be part of our lives. We wanted this pleasure of going into a theater and watching this magnificent entertainment, which had an awful lot to say about American society and world society at that time, and still does. O.J. Simpson was on trial. The Menendez brothers uh, had killed their parents. They were on trial. It was about publicity, it was about power, it was about money, uh, it, it was about amorality. All those things we hold near and dear to our hearts today. Exactly. And I mean, all, I, I, all yeah. over again. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the criminal, the criminal and celebrity, that's, that's what the show is about, which is, you know, as, uh, as current today as, as ever. You bet. We don't, want to, we don't want to name names. <laughs> yeah, we, but, well, let's. <laughs> you don't want to get into politics from the Supreme Court. Yeah, we, we don't need it. Uh, but the, the show is a mirror of our society and, in fact, tells us things that are going to happen before they happen. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, at the very end, the two ladies come together uh, and tell the audience what their postcards and messages of support meant. Uh, and that people are down on America, but we are the perfect example of what a wonderful country this is. Yeah. So it's happening all over again. Uh, Two of the greatest roles in, in musical history, uh, Roxy Hart and, and Velma Kelly. Oh my goodness. Uh, just, you know, and, and how do you top, as you've been pointing out, how do you top um, B.B. Newworth and, and Anne Reinking, who, by the way, did the choreography, uh, updated the, the yes. Fosse choreography. Yes. She knew what Bob would have wanted to bring it to a 96th level. Uh, and she set out to do it, and boy, did she do it. Now, yeah. Tony, uh, the, the problem here is we're in love with the show. Kendra and Eber are in love with the show. Poor man has a heart attack and the show still goes on and the poor guy is forgotten. A terrible moment, but the show prevailed. Now we get ready to put her on Broadway. Fran calls, you guys friends with Candor and Eb, she calls Fred to congratulate him, uh, I guess that evening on what a great, uh, you know, production this is and says, what, could we... How does she phrase it? Could we have a little no, no, piece? Could, could we be part of the new partnership? Obviously, producers are reaching out to them. We'd love to be part of that. And he told us, ain't no one reaching out. You're the only ones. Well, can we do it? It's all yours. Go I, but you got, you got to stop there for a minute. You're... By now, you've had some experience on Broadway, and you're seeing this show, and everybody, as you say, loves it. Fran gets a response from, from Fred Ebb saying, you can have it. Nobody wants it. I, 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 she must have dropped the phone at that point. It's too many years ago. I'm sure she was surprised. We were both surprised, but then we went to work. 
But why does why does nobody want it? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you that question. Tell me if I guessed at it. They look at a piece of material that looks like a concert, that acts like a concert, but they don't understand that's the style of the piece to let the message come through. They only see concert. They don't hear message. They don't see entertainment. I thought, I, I, I didn't even think Fran and I were crazy. I had no doubts, not for one single second, that this was something people would want to come see. I didn't realize it would be the hit it became or that it would run this long. I didn't think about that. All we thought about was let's get to Broadway. Now the problems begin. Barry, I'm going to I'm going to halt the story there and keep the audience around, got to tease them for you to come back next week and tell us how you got from that point of starting to put together a budget of the modest budget for a Broadway production of uh, of of Chicago and how it finally came about. Are you willing to come back and tell us that story? I, I will find a way to do it, Tony. Yes. Folks, you are not going to want to miss the rest of this story. It is <laughs> astounding what Fran and Barry Weisler had to do to make this happen. Um, Chicago, 25 years on Broadway, uh, the longest running American musical in Broadway history, and they are responsible. You want to you hear the rest of this story. Come back and see us next week.